If Twilight Zone is not in your podcast player, your music player, wherever you listen to great music, I can't do anything for you. That was Twilight Zone from the album Fool's Friends and the Great Beyond. Welcome to a very special edition of the ODPH podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. And right now, it is my honor to welcome back to the studio a friend of the show, an amazing musician. He did not come alone. He came with a lot of information and so much more to talk about. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the ODPH, the one and only Tom Jolu. Hey, what's going on? Tom, it is great to have you back in studio. And like I said, you did not come alone. So why don't I you introduce not. who you brought with you as well? So I have um, with me Matt. He is all, he's also the drummer of our band, co-producer of the album, and good friend. Hey. I'm, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> well, welcome to the show, Matt. We're definitely excited to have you here. Remember to join in the conversation on social media and use the hashtag TomJoluODPH because we just want to make sure everybody is aware of the new album that's coming out because it is fantastic. And Twilight Zone Thank is you. just like the tip of the iceberg for the music onslaught that's going to be hitting your earwaves. I am just super excited about this album. Super excited to have you back because the last time we did, obviously there's been a little change in the era that we live in. Yeah. And you just came out talking about the new music and everything that you have coming with it. And why don't we just walk through? Because like I said, the last time you were here, kind of just going through your musical journey, everything from Call Me Jonas to A is for Acoustics, B is for Bs. Yeah. And then you said, yeah, I got some new music coming out. I got a concept album in development. So as we were last talking, what has been the journey so far? So the journey so far, we recorded the album pre-COVID. It was probably, what, two weeks before everything went went to the... Yeah, it was the f- March 1st March. was when we recorded. Yeah. So we did a, a two-day extravaganza of nonstop recording. Um, so we did everything, all the principal tracks, done. And so the the plan was to release the album in actually last year around this time and then tour on it. Obviously, that didn't happen. Mm. Here we are. Um so this whole year has pretty much been post-production uh, and really just fine-tuning of what we're going to say with this album. Um, no, I mean, that's a great way to put it because obviously this is a uncharted water for anybody living yeah. in this era right now for the past two years. So to go into the musical process, I mean, obviously, like we said, you came off from the albums, A is for acoustic, B is for bees. Love those titles too, by the way. When Life Gives You Lemons, Have a Party and Call Me Jonah which is my for my personal favorite album. Thanks. Going into this direction, where would you think would be the kind of vibe that you were looking for with this? So the vibe itself for the album is it's a mix of sonically these these are my main themes that I was I was listening to a lot of at the time um Pink Floyd meets Bruce Sp- Springsteen. Okay. Um for everyone else it was a lot different because we all have a lot of different musical backgrounds and this was the first album where it wasn't just me orchestrating everything it was everybody putting in their own flavor and our guitarist james is super into prog rock um matt and his eclectic tastes of help me of of anything that's true yeah that's fair and then phil gets on the avant-garde stuff and connor is more uh funky stuff We'll, we'll go with that, and we'll, just, we'll categorize it under that umbrella. So everybody was putting their own flair with everything to make um, this whole album. And Matt, since you were being the producer of this album, like, what was your kind of expectations going with the vibe of this? Because like, there's so many eclectic tastes from the band going into the music process. Like, Did you have a vision of what you wanted to do for this or kind of guide Tom about this? Yeah, I mean, the only real expectation I had was to just get it all down as accurately and as quickly as possible because the way we planned to record like tom said we recorded the whole thing in ransom steel tavern okay over the two days that they were closed because in the before times i was the the house engineer there oh all right and so we were set to play a show on the saturday before and i asked mike jr i was like hey what if while you're closed on on sunday and monday we slept there after our show recorded all day slept there again and then recorded all day the next day and and he was like yeah absolutely go for it so my main concern was kind of getting everything done in that time frame because you know there's 
not really any going back like we could have the next weekend but after sure. that the the vibe is just kind of worn out so um in terms of vibe of the record i didn't have any expectations of like shaping it because every song was really kind of its own thing that it was just kind of like letting each song say what it wanted to because it does start off like you know kind of post rock and then there's like a, a folk rock section and then there's some like alternative stuff so it's it changes as you go through it so just letting each song say what it wanted to say and that's a very unique way to do because for anybody that doesn't live in the 607 ransom steel tavern is a place that has amazing acoustics and it's a great place to go catch up live music i mean highly recommend it so the fact that you guys were given permission while they're closed to go there and was that the first time the band had gotten together during the covid time so this this was pre COVID. Okay, this is pre COVID. This was still pre COVID. This was what two weeks? Yeah, this is when we all still had hopes and dreams. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So this is about two weeks before COVID. So this this whole initial process was the songs were written, everything was done before COVID, and then we did it. And then once we were about to be in post production, figure out how everything was working, then COVID happened, and we had to pivot and reevaluate what we were doing. I mean, that is just an, obviously just such a curveball thrown at you. But, I mean, that is obviously the state of the world going in. So to have the album just sitting there recorded, you have the energy of that. And then going through when everything is obviously shut down, you turn to streaming a lot to, yeah. start, to kind of keep that energy going to Tom Jolo Tuesdays. So if you're not following him on Facebook, you need to. Link is in the show notes as well. Got to give that a plug. And then just kind of what was the mentality going in with that? Uh, my mentality was I didn't know I didn't really know where we were going, what was happening, because uh, it was everything was in a state of, I guess chaos. I, I we'll go with chaos, yeah, because um, the world of how I knew how to promote music was the, it, the kibosh got put on it, so I didn't even know where to go. Um, so I just went to streaming. I went to to live streaming every week for a while, and then after that we we just still didn't know what we were doing. So and the album wasn't done. Um, it was pretty much the whole principal track was done. The post-production, the spices, the, the, the good barbecue rub of the album was not done. So we were just trying to figure out what we were going to do with that. And this, it took about a few months of, for the shock to wear off to where we were like, all right, we need to start working on this again. And then, Matt, from the direction of that, I mean, obviously, Tom is kind of doing the music there, but you still had all the music recorded, just the principles, and it was just like, as Tom touched about, and I love how you analyze that, just the rub needed to put on, you need just the final touches. Was there anything that really changed from, like, that initial time at Ransom to when it started seeming like, okay, we're going to start getting the ball rolling again? Um, as in, like, meeting together as a, as a band? Because when after everything went down, like, right up until – New York went fully on pause. We were still kind of getting vocals done. Okay. Um, because we didn't do vocals at Ransom. We just did, you know, all the instruments and then yeah. we would overdub the vocals. So it was, it was around when we were finishing up, you know, background vocals and, and lead vocals to where we were like, hey, maybe we should think about not getting together anymore. Right. Because things, things are getting tough. Um, so yeah, it really kind of was, we, we got put on pause, like right in the middle of everything. And it wasn't until probably, I don't know, because I was moving into the studio right after then and yeah. the studio was kind of halfway done when we started like putting percussion on things and, and reamping stuff and like really kind of getting back into production. So it was probably around, uh, maybe between July and August, kind of when we had a lull. Okay. Um, when we were kind of like, oh, maybe things are going to get better. And then there was that like ridiculous spike in the in the fall. Yeah. So probably midsummer is when we were like, okay, let's get together, you know, put percussion on things and kind of pick up where we left off. And then just was it still like the same ideas you had going through? Or did anything like really change, would you say, from the direction of the album? Or is it just kind of like when everybody gets into the room, that's when it really dictates the pace of the album and the and the theme of the album? Mm, nothing super changed, um, at least in my head, because, I mean, it, again, it just gave me time to think, gave me time to, because I, I was the principal lyric writer, and I've had this idea stewing around in my head for going on three years now. So, and I've had a lot of ideas of what I wanted to do, what I wanted to say. And since we had the time, the the, the special sauce and the, and the spices, we was like, all right, that was a lot of time where uh, Matt and I just sat in the studio and more Matt than me, but I had an, a musical direction of what I wanted to do in my head. And I was like, hey, Matt, can you do these things? And he said, 
Yeah, probably. Would you say it was more of a challenge for for both of you since it was just you guys couldn't really meet up to talk about the process, but just I mean, just doing the communication exchange, still being on the same page about it. Um, you want to take that one? Well, very luckily, not a whole lot changed in like the macro presentation and macro arrangement because we had done so much demoing, so much rehearsing to get to the, prepare ourselves for the the two day sprint that we were uh, getting ready for. So. Mostly everything was done when we when we recorded. So really, the the only stuff that changed was uh, maybe we added extra background vocals and extra saucy things like in the in the vignettes and the in between song yeah. uh, kind of soundscapes. So luckily, we had done a whole lot of uh, preparation so that nothing really had to change because we had decided a lot of it beforehand. Yeah, and then when talking about the decision about the album too. The concept album, which Tom mentioned the last time he was on the show, how did that all come to be about? So that, it kind of came about um, pretty much the first and the last lyric of the whole album was already written before the album even started. Um, really? It was, I did. A, I was doing a lot of, this album again was started before the band, before it was literally just me. It was during what you're striving for time. Okay. So this was years ago. Um, we know what you're striving for slash, uh, call me Jonah it was around that time. So it was still just me. So giving the listeners a time frame about that. 2018, 2017, 2018. Yeah. Something like that. Range. So you, so we're talking about a good four years. Yeah. From now. Yep. So went on a tour and I, I just got done with Jonah, but it was still, my brain wanted to keep writing and I was at work doing a 12 hour shift and the first and last lyric came in my head. So I was right, wrote it down real quick and then went on and then pretty much I just wanted to talk about because touring was how I felt alive I felt a lot of things um, emotions etc etc whatever but I just wanted to give the mindset of traveling in a whole album at, uh, in between these two lyrics um, no that's just such a very unique thing concept to build build off it because you think about it it's been time frame it's been four years and you've been sitting with the last line of the album already written Mm -hmm. i mean that's just such a cool concept to me no pun intended (laughs) it's um it's a lot of stuff uh i see it you see it a lot in poetry you see it a lot in especially uh lyricists uh surprisingly lord she did that um with the album pure heroin i think it was the first lyric and the last lyric create a sentence Okay. And that's same thing with this. And same with thing with poetry. There's a lot of things where if you go back and they have a whole book of their poems, the first sentence and the last sentence, essentially that's the whole thesis statement of this whole giant amalgamation of work. Right on. I mean, that's just such a very unique thing that you don't hear a lot about too in songwriting. It's just, it's an underlying theme, yeah. but it's something that once you really start digging into and getting in an idea and a vibe of an album, it's just hearing those little stories. It just adds a little more intrigue to the album. And I mean, I are always hearing about concept albums and everybody I think has a different version of it. So, I mean, when you hear that, I mean, what's your instant reaction, both of you about this? My instant reaction is Dark Side of the Moon. Okay. Instant reaction that's, uh, at least when it comes to sonically, that's how I was first introduced to a concept album. Um, sorry, Matt. Go ahead. No, I mean, uh, I'm having trouble thinking of any concept albums that I've listened to, but you kind of operate that way all the time. Like pretty much all of your full lengths have been concept albums, right? Yeah. Yeah, they've all been pretty much a, a uh, directly from my notebook. Um, so Josephine was a the journal after my mother died that whole year. That's what that was. Oh, wow. Uh, Call Me Jonah was um, my notebook for like about a year or so of just trying to start over, um, I guess, relationship, figuring out how I wanted to be in relationships, how I didn't want to be, how I was as a person, trying to figure out myself in that. Um, this one is more finding the hope to move on, uh, through a lot of difficult mental, uh, problems that I have. But that's just being honest. And I mean, it's just one thing that as a fan listening to an artist, the more authentic it is and the more real it is. I mean, that's when you have the stronger connection. I feel that is just when somebody is that vulnerable to open up and really give them your soul. And then to really just hear that come through their music, 
it's just truly one of the most powerful things about writing music. And I mean, just writing in general. And I mean, you do it so brilliantly on this. It's just, thank you. Oh yeah. No, I mean, I'm, I am always blown away when I hear songs like better man. And when you start really just opening up about that, I mean, weight is a perfect example about that too. Like, is just something that when you hear it come out of the artist and you just hear everything just perfectly meshed together and you can just feel that emotion out of it. I mean, that's yeah. where it really connects. Funny enough with weight, I didn't write the lyrics to that song. Really? Really. Um, so I wrote the music, all the music to that song, but a uh, former band I used to be in, uh, the singer wrote those lyrics and he's credited as the half songwriter for that song. Like he gets his rights and stuff. Um, but he wrote the lyrics. It just That was a song that really resonates with me. That we that we played that I was like, hey, can I do a cover of our song? And he said, yeah. So, yeah, because when you play that live, I mean, you can definitely hear. It. I mean, just the band sounds so amazing when you hear it, and then you just resonate with the vocals on it. It's like I did not really go deep diving in about that. Yeah, that just blows my mind right now. That because you just give it with so much passion, and everybody just playing right behind it, it just takes it to a different place that I don't think that a lot of listeners get a lot of, uh, from music these days. Yeah. I just really don't. I think that I, you go through so many different emotions when you just make yourself that vulnerable. I mean, that's just the one thing. And you just really pointed it out there. So to bring this into a concept album, like that's just got to be such an interesting path to walk. It was definitely a journey, especially figuring out where the songs go. Cause I had a general idea. I wrote the first three songs on a tour. I wrote another half of the songs on tour i wrote most of it on tour or traveling in one form or another so it was pretty much all made on the road i think maybe one of the songs i was drunk at a bar and i wrote it but that's about it but that's real life though yeah i mean that's the thing <laughs> it, it, when it's real and authentic that's when it really makes for the best yeah. songs when it's just something that you don't feel and don't feel passionate about. And I mean, I'm sure, Matt, you can kind of go through the same thing. It's just if you're not creating your own music, but you're doing something else and you can't really relate to it, it just doesn't come out as good. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So that being said, let's throw in a quick break because we're talking about all those great musics. I want to throw in just another Tom Jolu classic. So we are going to take a break, but definitely stay tuned. We have more to talk with Matt Evers and Tom Jolu about the new album that you need to get in your podcast player. You need to get in your music player. You need to get in your system. However you get that music into your soul, you need to get it. TomJolu.com, but we are going to go play False Prophet. You are listening to the ODPH Podcast. Yes, you are. You speak truth and it's my life. Oh, life. Oh, oh, oh. Truth and 
Yeah. Coming back for another segment on this special edition of the Thank ODPH you. podcast with Matt Ebers and Tom Jolo in studio talking about the new Tom Jolo album, Fools, Friends, and the Great Beyond. Last segment, we broke down what Tom and the company have been up to since they last swung by the ODPH. It's been a hell of a musical journey, I have to say, just from the intimate recordings to obviously dealing with the environment we live in now to finally we are here. The album is complete. And it's ready to go on TomJolu.com. But it's not a simple point and click. No, no, no. Tom, why don't you walk us through this? So we decided that this album was not going to be... The concepts and everything, it, it was it's so near and dear to my heart, at least lyrically, that I didn't want to just put it on streaming. And I didn't want to do that. And I didn't want to just release a, a single and another single and then the album just put on streaming. That wasn't... Uh, that wasn't what felt right. This is a very intimate album, lyrically for me, um, talking about things I haven't talked about with anyone really. So I, I decided to bring everybody in and make this per experience more personal. And I definitely have to say with it, being somebody that has signed up for it and getting the personal emails every day, that when you're in the experience, it's been a truly intimate moment with talking to an artist because you're not sitting there just giving the whole generic cut and paste message to everybody. It's like you're really trying to connect with the fans that really have spent the time to click on the album, get the experience, get to know every process going on with this. And it really just adds something that if you've been a fan before, you're going to get more excited about this album. If you've never met Tom or anybody else in the band, you're going to really get to know them very well. Yeah, that's what I try to do with the emails. It's not just you're another number, you're another fan, you're another nameless person. I want to get to know people because they're, you're signing up to something that is, it's a, it's a lot. It, it's, it's a seven day experience and it's a lot, but it's an exciting thing that I'm really excited about. And I want you to be excited about. And I'm trying to feed off each other's energy, make everything work with each other. And I'm not trying to just bullshit anyone with anything. No, I think it comes off very authentic. And then Matt, being somebody that is involved in the production of this, where is your take about coming up with this way of releasing the album? Like, is this something that you've seen done before? And what was your input about this as well? Yeah, I mean, I think we've all kind of done the thing where you work very, very hard on something you care very much about and you put it out there and you, you just hope people listen and get as excited about it as, as you do. Which, um, if you've ever done that, you know that it just it doesn't work that way. Right. So, because you know, anytime anyone puts effort into a work, um, there's you know things that happen over the course of it. There's there's a lot of love and detail and care that you put into the work itself that you want to share with people in detail. And so, you, instead of waiting, you know, kind of casting it out there, waiting for people to find it, enjoy it, and come to us, we're trying to be as transparent with everything as we can so that we can invite people to enjoy it for the same reasons that we enjoyed making it. And that's a great experience for a fan too, because you can definitely feel the emotion coming off this, that it's not just something that is just, Hey, thank you for donating on however you're paying for this album. No, this is just something that as a fan, you can definitely connect with and just getting those emails and making you feel not that you're just another fan, but you're almost part of the listening group right there in the crowd yeah and the cool thing with this is that if you sign up for the album sign up for the experience it's completely free that's the coolest thing so so what you get with the album yes you get the song you get free to download the song via wave or mp3 wherever you want to listen to it however you want to listen to it it's there that's there and then you get the lyrics to the song because i mean it's it's in detail that seems so mundane seems so whatever but it's, I don't know, it's one of those things where people take advantage of listening to lyrics, and I know that my voice gets a little Eddie vettor and sometimes I slur my words a little bit, so it's like, hey, what are you saying? Like, well, guess what? There they are. That's what I'm saying. Uh, another thing that's happening with it is you're getting pre-demos that only the band has seen. Um, wow. Demo versions, and they're completely different, especially since I wrote a lot of them by myself before the band was even a thing. That is wild because you talked about obviously writing some of the ideas down for this album in 2017 to now hear it in its rawest form all these years later. I mean, how is that for an experience? I 
so when I was compiling all the files together and listening to them, I was I was kind of blown away, um, like how drastically different some of the songs are. Some of them kind of just came out and they just came out how they came out, and they're still more or less a little more orchestrated, but same version. But some of the songs have more lyrics. Some of the songs are different tempos, different phrasings. It, it's some of them are drastically different. Um, but that's definitely something that's a little, that can be jarring or can be interesting to see the progress of a song when it's, bet- when it's just one person to five people. Yeah. Cause that is just a day and night difference. I mean, just to put it mildly, I mean, just from the infancy of the song to now that you have more people giving their input on it and turning it from something very small into something very big. It's just truly an experience that you just can't really describe. I mean, that's like the easiest way to say it. It's like, oh, yeah, day and night. But it's really more complex than that, I would say. So then with signing up for this at TomJolu.com, this is now going to be going live on June 18th. June 18th. So why don't you break it down for us? June 18th, I sign up. I'm like, okay going to start getting the experience what should i be expecting to see coming my way so what you can expect to see like i said the songs in any and every form that you want you can download it right there or you can wait till the uh, seventh day and download the whole thing yourself or get a link to it uh you can expect that you can expect the lyrics like i said before uh old demos uh and then we did a mini documentary for this whole album so you get to see i think it's what it's seven part um mini documentary that we made just for this album. Um, That's insane. That's I mean, just to allow that creative process to be taped. And I mean, to Matt, being somebody that is producing this, did that give any extra pressure to do? Or was it just like, no, the camera's here, but this is going to really show you the behind the curtain? No, yeah, no, no extra pressure. It was um, originally we wanted to do it because the whole album experience is kind of the culmination of appealing to different types of listeners. So... Some people are lyric people and they really enjoy the poetry of it. Some people are process people. They really enjoy the behind the scenes, the demos. Um, some people are like sonic people where they just listen to music for the sonics of it. So every work that anyone puts out is kind of a drop down menu of all of those things. So because I'm kind of a process person, I love to see behind the scenes stuff. I was like, we really need to record this so that we can share it with people because it's always... <laughs> I don't know. There's always stuff that happens when we get together that you wish that there was a camera rolling. So this is kind of us uh, actually doing that for once and then being able to share it with the world so that people can get like pretend they were there with us at the yeah. time. And that's just so cool as a fan to see, because a lot of times you'll see like the polished version, like, OK, there was a camera here, but we'll edit stuff out. We'll really not give you the whole version. This is just, hey, we're going to give you everything at once uncooked uncensored this is the real deal of the process making into a concept album that we just don't really ever see like i say just a lot of times you see those documentaries on tv and you're like okay how real is that because they know a camera's there yeah and knowing you this is going to be like nope put the camera on let's go live yeah win lose draw this is what we got yeah that was definitely a little weird at first having a camera and i'm like oh yeah it's just stuff and it's fine (laughs) um but then another thing that you're going to get if you're if you want to know the story, if you're a story person, you want to know how this why was the song made? How was the song made? I dug through my journals. There's a lot of them and I can't read my writing most of the time nowadays. Um it's small. If it, anyway, it's small. Don't worry, mine's mine's yeah. absolutely tra- it's, atrocious. It's small. There's a lot, but I dug through the notebooks and found really where I was mentally with all the songs. Um, so I, there's a tour journal, essentially. That's what I, we're calling it through the whole thing. And it's just kind of a glimpse into my mind of where I was, what's going on in my life to make those songs. And I just pretty much just tr- transcribed. There were definitely things that didn't make sense, only made sense to me. So I had to like give a little context, but more or less, it's just my journal entries. That's so crazy. I mean, just to think that it's been how many years and now you're going to see them. And just get that whole experience. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's so cool as a fan to get that it's just like, you just don't hear this in music these days, in my opinion. That a lot of times everybody's really kind of, I don't want to say guarded about that, but a lot of times they don't really want to make themselves that vulnerable. And one thing that both of you have done with recording the process and just really giving everybody the glimpse of what is going on behind the scenes. 
I think is just something that's going to definitely radiate with fans and get more people into your music. Yeah. And the thing, so the thing back in the day that was like super interesting about bands, their mystique, uh, Led Zeppelin, the super mysterious, all the other bands, you don't know what's going on with the process. But nowadays, you know, there's so much information that you can get. And I want to kind of be the opposite. It's like, we are real people. We're not some mythical beings. We're just some dudes playing music, talking about our feelings. And what better way does that? I mean, that's music in, in a nutshell. Yeah. It's just when an artist is that real about it. And that's why I say that real music will always kind of stand out. Anybody that's kind of trying to be something they're not usually doesn't last too long. Yeah. And just for you being such a vulnerable musician and just letting it all out, and to Matt and just the rest of the band really bringing that to life. I mean, it's just like the perfect combination when you hear the music live. Because, I mean, I remember when I heard you guys for the first time, and I was like, holy crap, like, what is this? And just to hear just the raw energy coming out just was completely blowing away and just made me a fan instantly. Thank you. Yeah, because nice. cause a lot of times you just don't get that. A lot of times when you start seeing ones that have made it and, and just don't have that drive. Yeah. You know, when you can go on stage, you can definitely tell, like, yeah, they're they're playing, but are they really playing? Yeah, no, I I, I got, a, got a lot of demons. To, I got ex- exercise, so that's that's how I get it out with, with music. Um, and then there's another cool thing. So, again, if you're a process person, uh, Matt has, and this is where I pl- point to you. Um, one of the things that we thought about doing for the album experience, because a lot of sound design stuff kind of kind of made it onto the record so i i wanted to kind of get out in front of things and make a behind the scenes a separate behind the scenes video series on you know some of the shimmery ear candy stuff so there's there's something that happens in pretty much every song that is like oh that's that's a different like a non-musical thing okay so it's just a, a behind the scenes of me um, unpacking one the vignettes that kind of like usher you from song to song, but also some of the the sound design sonic imagery that happens in the album. So just trying to cover all of our bases. Yeah, and that's so detailed too. That I mean, I wouldn't even think about doing that. But that is just, I mean, kudos to you guys for bringing that to the table. Yeah, and just really illustrating that point. And I definitely can't really take all the credit for this idea. I went um, last year, last October. I went through an album experience myself with a band called Basic Printer, and it more or less the same idea. It just, but I realized that, and that album itself was such a personal album, and I realized that we, I made a personal album myself. We did such, put so much work, so much love, so much effort and time, and we just, I, there's no, why not just give it all the attention it deserves? Yeah. I mean, that's and that's especially what you want to do, because especially with a project that you've been building on for so long, you want to give it its proper due. Yeah. That you don't want to just go and I don't want to say mail it in, but you want to make sure that you get every point nailed on it. Yeah. Because this has just been such a, a, a labor of emotion to do that you really want to present it in the best format possible. And all of this, like we say, you can go to TomJolu.com, click on a very easy link, put in some quick information, and boom, you have the music. Yeah. And you have the experience and everything that is Tom Jolu coming. And then even more down later this year, you said uh, off air we have a merch store coming? Yes. Um, so June 18th, once you go through the experience, um, you can go through the whole thing. Again, you can get the album for free, take it, whatever. It's yours if you want it. And then you go through the experience. And if you feel, wow, I want more for, through this experience, I, I d- did a lot. I, I experienced a lot. We have merch. We have we have a merch store coming. It's through Shopify. Um, I'm pretty much done with it. All I gotta do is kind of hit the the go live button and it'll be ready. Um, but we have t-shirts, stickers, buttons. Um, one thing that we're gonna do, gonna make a small run because I don't know if they're gonna work either way. But uh, we're making them ourselves. Also, print the t-shirts ourselves. Wow, it's just going complete DIY. A- as much as I can. Because it's cheaper that way. <laughs> well, yeah. And and we're broke. <laughs> uh, but uh, so the tour journals itself, going to make physical copies of them, about 10 of them. Wow. So see how that works. And if people are into it, then we might, you know, spend a little more, more money and make some more. But right now we're just making DIY 10 booklets. No, that's a perfect thing to start out with, too, because that – like I say, going on the fan experience, you don't really see that too much. Yeah. And to have that kind of unique gift. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of just what 
this whole album is a uh, uh, to steal Matt's lines. Um, it's a it's a musical journey. Uh, it's a musical road trip. Um, and then, again, there's a lot of imagery. There's a lot of so I'm just thinking of what would be cool to have. Like, what do you have on a road trip? Do you have? I have a torn journal. I have. We have bumper stickers for sale. We have anything that you could. That I'm trying to think of what we have, and then just kind of put it out all in merch style and see what sticks and what doesn't. And if it doesn't stick, it's okay. We made it ourselves. No, I mean, that's perfectly all right to do because when you got one shot to take, you got to take it. Yeah. And especially with this album coming out June 18th, that you can start getting the experience. I mean, obviously, Twilight Zone is now available wherever you stream great music, and you should already have a download by the end of this episode. Just putting that out there. <laughs> yes. So, so that all being said, we know that this coming week as we are recording, you're doing a live stream with our good friends Yard Party. Yes, we are. So why don't you break down that? And this is now the first time... In how many months has the entire band been together to play? We were together March. Yeah, I think starting around. So there. we did. It wasn't a live show. It was um, our friend of ours, Kevin, does a, a YouTube series called Subterranea. Yes, shout out to Kevin Kober. Yes. Um, and he invited us on, so we decided to play, obviously. Um, and we got together and we played, and it was wonderful. It was wonderful to get everybody together. Phil came up because Phil's from in Kentucky now. Oh, wow. Uh, so he came up for the weekend and played with us, and then he went back down. But this is the first time in since March that we're getting together and also with our newest with our newer bassist. Oh, wow. So we got some new members joining the band. Yeah. And then going back to the show at Subterranea, Matt, let me throw this question to you. Since this is the first time in a long time hearing that music live, what was the experience seeing you, obviously having such a hands-on approach with Tom about this, the experience of playing, even though it's just right on Subterranean, which you can go to YouTube and find, definitely go follow that channel. What was the experience for you sitting back and just obviously playing and just that whole emotion right there? Something that I noticed, I don't know if you noticed this, is the songs are still forming. Like they're still becoming yeah. their like most uh, complete selves. Yeah. Which is why a while ago we started recording every show we played, like in the before times. Um, whether it's just on like a task cam or when we would play at Ransom Steel Tavern, I would multi-track it off the board. Um, so we started recording everything just so we can have an archive. And that's what um, A is for Acoustic, B is for Bs came from. That was basically our recording archive. Okay. And so we still have a, a – I was looking through our archive when we still have a ridiculous amount of content from the before times, from shows that no one's ever heard. Oh, wow. So there is a – we had the A, um, A is for blank, B is for blank. We're definitely going to do a C is for something, D is for something. So after in – the, in the wake of this album's release, definitely we're going to put out another – live album like like that one yeah but um so if you go back and and watch some of our live content on our youtube channel or listen to that uh live record because there's songs that are from fool's friends in the great beyond that we used to play when we were workshopping them and the arrangement from before when we were just like recording them before we put them to tape is different than they were on the record itself and they're different now like on in the subterranean session they, i play them differently as a drummer so we started recording because we believe that songs live multiple lives, which is why we love to hear the demos. We love to, uh, you know, listen to the records version of stuff. But then I love live recordings more than anything because you capture such unique moments. And sometimes th that's the best version of it. That's the most complete version of it. So the songs are still changing. I love that line. L songs live multiple lives. That's so good. That's so honest, too, because they do. I mean, especially since you really adapt to them when you go playing. That is just something that really stands out. And obviously we say this coming week you have the show with with the art party. Yeah. And then what is the plans now that it's, things are starting to slowly open back up? Rough it's, shot. Rough shot. Um, I haven't – we haven't really planned any shows, but I'd like to do uh, – since my birthday this year, uh, September 25th lands on a Saturday, probably somehow do a show that day. Um, and maybe an album release, or maybe even make that the album release show. I don't know, because uh, it'll be releasing. So what we're doing with the album, if you sign up for the experience, you get it in June. You get it in June. Um, but if you don't sign up for the experience, the album doesn't come to streaming until October 8th. Okay. Um, but you get a single a month from uh, this past week all the way until October. 
So, so, so every you're getting month, five singles. Yep. So you get five singles coming straight to you, and then the album is officially released on September 25th. No, nope, kind of, uh, uh, well, October 8th. October 8th is, is the technical one, but we might just celebrate that as just Thomas Jolu Day. Yeah. On September 25th, <laughs> because by that time, the music will be ready to go. In theory, everything will be starting to open really back up. Yeah. If we stay on this path, knock on. Yeah. I'm knocking on some wood right now as we go, and then from there it's just. If everything is open back up, just in the perfect world scenario, are we talking touring? Are we talking... We're talking a definite tour, uh, possibly early 2022. I don't know, Um, because we all have our separate work schedules. Matt works with the college, um, and then everybody else has their different work schedules. Obviously, Phil lives in Kentucky, so we have to coordinate with him. So we don't know. That's pretty much the big, big answer. We don't know. But we want to do all these things, but we're still kind of waiting because there's shows happening. We're seeing them happen, uh, but we don't know. Like, no, that's it's like I'm just trying to play it safe because I don't want to have expectations and then have them blown away because there's a big surge or something. Oh, absolutely. I mean, obviously, it's it's always card subject to change, like we say in pro wrestling. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's just with everything happening, you don't know. But just in the perfect world, it's like okay, yeah. if the door is starting to finally open, where are we going to take this journey? Yeah, it's definitely. Uh, birthday show hopefully for me and then uh, probably early 2022 uh, we're gonna do a tour I don't know where but I'd love to do a tour we do have on the second Saturday in June is the second Saturday show oh so we do have we do have we do have one show shows coming we do have a couple shows I keep forgetting about that that's gonna be Acousta Jolu yeah oh outside at the Vestal Museum Oh, very nice. Um, yes. Second Saturday. And we, last time we second did Second Saturday in June. Yeah. So that's June 12th. Whatever day it is. I believe yeah. It's a June 12th because June 9th, I kept thought, thinking it was June 9th. It's not June okay. 9th. It's June 12th. Yeah. And last time we played, it's going to be similar to the videos we have on our YouTube page of um, of us playing. It, it's going to be outdoors this time, but it'll be very similar setup to when we played the first time. It's uh, I'm on a cajon. It's our stripped down yes. version. Stripped down version. Um Yep, I'm on acoustic guitar. James still has electric. Reeve will be doing his his bass thing on his electric, and Phil will be there. Um, nice. So it, it'll be a full show, two hour show, of us playing all the songs. Yeah. And speaking of songs with multiple lives, like uh, when life gives you lemons, have a party is entirely different acoustic than I, it is uh, electric. I can only imagine because I I've only heard the electric version because I I know there's an acoustic one. I just can't pull myself to do it because I that was the first song I ever heard you guys play. And I was just like, I always have that image stuck in the head because when you have the first impression, yeah, it's like, I don't want to do anything. Not that it would tarnish it, yeah, but it's like, I don't want to hear it and go like, oh, and, and kind of take away from that memory. Because like I say, I remember seeing you the first time is when Tyler was down here from Second Suitor and he was hyping up the Valentine's Day show that you guys were playing. Yes. And, he, and I remember going there and running into Jimmy Gazdick and Tom from Floodlands. And they were like, have you ever seen Tom J- Jolu play? I'm like, no. They're like, Jimmy, I think, might have thrown me like right in the front row. And he's like, you stay here the entire show <laughs> and tell me you're not a fan by the end of this. And literally, you guys came out just blaring with that sonic energy and made me an instant fan. Was that at the bowling alley? Yes. Yeah. That was the first time we ever did Tom Joe Doom. Oh, yeah. So at the at the end of Lemon Party... We do the I don't know it's kind of a, kind of a breakdown and then there's like a breakdown of a breakdown where it gets like even it's like halftime and sludgier and that was yeah. the first time we ever did that was that show really yeah oh wow and we re- we recorded we have recordings of it. you can see it on our Instagram that's why we record uh, everything because you know you never know what's gonna happen yeah and Phil didn't know about it we sprung it on him he had no idea what was happening I destroyed my thumb counting off if you watch on my Instagram or on Tom's Instagram. If you watch it, because I put a camera next to me, if you watch me count it, the second time I hit, I destroyed my thumb with the, oh, yeah. with the drumstick. Holy shit! But that was the first time we ever did that. So you you were there for the first. So now, but now that's like an active part of our repertoire, and we continue like continually uh, tweak that formula formula because we did we're doing something yeah, different on the live stream with it and a different song. So yeah, that's why we record everything because you, you know, we don't want to get, not that we ever would get bored of our own songs, but like we always, you know, we change as people, we want to do different things. So we, we tweak the formula, but yeah. you saw the first one, first time Joe doom. That's so crazy. Yeah. We, we like to spice it up. We like to make things different. Um, I'm very, I love Jack white, love everything he does. He doesn't have a set list. Unfortunately we can't be as like, I'm, I have to have some sort of 
outline for myself. Otherwise, I don't know what to do. Um, but we always tweak, uh, make, uh, what's the football term? Oh, you're audible. We always do audibles, um, especially on longer sets. And man, I just felt like such a such a nerd right there. Like, well, what's the football term? <laughs> It, it's all right. I talk sports every week. So no, it, it's fine because like I, it was on my, it was always on my tongue because I was hanging out with Tyler Reed all the time, and he, he, he eats, breathes, sleeps football. Yes, he does. Big Tennessee Titans fan. Yes, he is. Yeah, and I mean, I just remember taping because I was taping that show too. Which I, we think we still have the footage up at the ODPH Facebook page. Okay. Of because I was doing it on Instagram stories. Yeah, that show obviously was just an amazing show, top to bottom too. And just to see that energy, like if you're not sure about how Tom and Matt and the rest of the band bring it live, just watch those videos. Go search them out on YouTube because they definitely deliver on it. And just to see that the album is now finally done, we're going to get some new Tom Jolo music is truly, truly an awesome time. I want to throw in one last break before we wrap up this episode. So let's go back to play the song. You hear this on 607 TWS each and every week as we kick into the show. This is Sideshow by Tom Jolu. Make sure to hit up that hashtag, hashtag Tom Jolu ODPH. Continue the conversation, and we'll be right back. Sitting at the bar, beer in hand, as you come up to me, sir, about your ex man. If I was him, I would have left you too.
Life gets hard, you sit and think And then you drink it all away When life gets hard, you sit and think And then you drink it all away Say you're nothing like my dad Your life ain't hard Coming back for the final segment on this special edition of the ODPH podcast with Matt Evers and Tom Jolu in studio talking about Fool's Friends and the Great Beyond, the album you need to sign up for right now at TomJolu.com. Famous last words, guys. Why should the ODPH Society go get this album? All right. The reason why is because if you're a music person or a lyrics person, or anything, any tidbit of information that you ever wanted to know about a band, go look at this album. You go, go to the experience, you will see any and every piece of information that you would ever want on a band. Enough said. There you go. Matt? Yeah, I mean, this record really, we've said it before, has something for everyone. It's got a bunch of different genres. It covers a lot of um, musical ground, metaphorical ground, emotional ground. So there's probably something in there that you might like. And if you like any of it at all, you can go all the way down the rabbit hole of it because we've probably prepared some piece of content to uh, explain it a little bit further. We definitely have. I definitely have to agree too. I mean, I've heard a little bit of it right now. I do have a copy in my possession that I have to go check out as soon as the show is done. I promise them I will not leak it online. But let me just tell you this. If Twilight Zone is not the song of 2021, the summertime, if you're not playing at your barbecues, not playing at your picnics, not playing at your parties, seriously, you need to get your music taste checked very, very quickly. And I don't want to hear any negative reviews online about it as well because I did see that egregious comment that I will not comment about on air. <laughs> But, guys, I just want to say before I let you say the final shout-outs, thank you so much for coming back on the thank show. Thank you for having me. No, thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. Anytime you guys want to come back down to the studio, you just let me know. We will make that happen because I'm a firm believer of the music. It stands up for itself. You should go through the entire discography of Tom. Go get those albums. And I know that you can get some of it for free. You should definitely send him some coin because it's definitely worth it. Support your local musicians and support their habits because they're giving you great content to get you through your day. So that all being said, final shout-outs starting with Tom. Final shout-outs from me, uh, Dave and Ryan from Yard Party, and also Julian from Shout Out the Robots. They helped us out with the album. Uh, they did some gang vocals for us. Really appreciate them for doing that. Um Mm-hmm. Jesse Gillen Waters from Basic Printer for really kind of sprouting the idea of this album experience in my head. Um, and yeah, just love all the information that was given. So there's that. And who else? That's all I got. Uh, yeah, that's all I got. Shout out to Second Suitor for being our sister band, Thank essentially. You. Um, shout out to Kevin Cover for just being a scene legend, if anyone uh, has that title. Kevin. And Michael Mitcha for just being wonderful in general. Yeah, he's nice. He smells great. <laughs> oh, yeah, duh. Michael Mitcha did the album cover. Duh. Oh, my god. Oh, my God. Okay, real quick. The album cover looks the way the album sounds to us. When we were picking through some of uh, the wonderful art that Michael Mitcha made, that was the one that really stuck out. This kind of encapsulates everything in one image. There's the road trip. There's the absurdity, the abstract nature, just everything. So, Michael Mitcha, uh, thank you. It's just great. Yeah, it's a fantastic looking cover, too. You definitely need to go to TomJolu.com. Go sign up for this album. I'm going to give you the highest possible recommendation for it. It is that damn good. You need to get it to your player. Gentlemen, thank you again for coming on the show. Thank and, you again for having us. Oh, Appreciate it. Anytime, anytime. Thank you for listening to this very special edition of the ODPH podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. Let's take you out with another Tom Jolu song. This is Better Man. We'll see you next time.
trying to sleep inside my bed, but yet I sit inside my head, trying to force these dreams that will not come. So it's another night of listening to the crickets and the train tracks sing the songs of longing, love, and of loss. But how can I relate to bugs and trains when I cannot relate to you telling me you want the good, the better, the best, or whatever may come? You got a better man in this deal. Despite how I do, I do not feel. You got a better man in this deal. Despite how I do, I do not feel. So I do it again. I'm thinking as I sit and sing, do I love you? Are the idea you bring? Are you a puzzle piece to the problem that I see? But you're not a piece. You're a human being with thoughts and feelings and ideas to bring to this crazy world that we find ourselves in. You got a better man in this deal, despite how it do. I do not feel. Got a better man in this deal, despite how I do. I do not feel. So I do it again. Selfish to let this go in my head and my heart. I know it's been two years or more since I've known your taste. Now we're different people with different dreams, same beautiful lives, but different scenes that you see when you're looking back at me. Got a better man in this deal, despite how I do. I do not feel. You got a better man in this deal, despite how I do. I do not feel. So I do it again.